So good morning, and thank you for attending this important event at El Centro College. I'd like to recognize elected officials, Dallas County Community College Trustee Monica Bravo, and Trustee Diana Flores. I'd also like to recognize Councilman Adam Magoo, who will be speaking a little bit later as well. Also in attendance, we have President Gene Conway of Eastfield College. Gene? We also have in attendance representing the Dallas Fallen Officers Association board member Armando Tijerina, Sonia Godinez, Erica Gutierrez, Heather Hernandez, Sergeant Penny is in San Antonio with a Fallen Officers family. Thank you for attending. I'd like to ask all uniformed police officers, whether from D, Triple C, D, or Dallas, or DART, to please stand and be recognized. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'd like to now begin with some introductory remarks. Today marks the first anniversary of the fatal ambush on police officers in downtown Dallas. It brings back painful memories. Five officers were killed in the attack on July, of July 7, 2016. Two El Centro officers, John Abbott and Brian Shaw, were injured as the perpetrator shot through glass windows to gain entry into this building. I'd like to ask John Abbott to please stand. Thank you. Thank you. Brian Shaw is away on, on vacation. July 7, 2016 is now part of the 50-year history of our college. And while a year has passed, the horrific memories and emotional toll continues for many of us. In turn, the college demonstrates its resilience and capacity for renewal. The slain officers were Michael Crow, Lauren Ahrens, Brent Thompson, Patrick Zamaripa, Michael Smith. Seven officers were shot, and let's not forget that two peaceful demonstrators, civilians, were also shot. I ask you to join me in a moment of silence for our fallen officers. Thank you. Those of us, like myself, not in your uniform, may not comprehend the challenges associated with being a police officer in society today. They are asked, as our El Centro police officers are asked, to do far more than arrest people and give citations. They are first responders. They are medics. They are counselors. They're advisors. They're listeners. And yes, they protect us and run towards the sound of gunfire and run towards the, sun, the sound of gunfire as they did on July 7th, while most of us run away from that sound. It's part of their training. It's part of their DNA. It's why they are in uniform. In the past week, 
the Dallas Morning News has run a series of articles on the July 7th tragedy. They remind us of the gun-related shootings around the country. One of the articles asked the question, what kind of country are we creating where such violence has become so frequent? So the article makes the provocative, provocative statement about Dallas. We live together, but we do not often understand one another. Why? Class distinctions, geography, often race, and language play a part. It is fair to say that the abrasive national discourse, absence of civility, and appreciation for the fact that words do matter and can hurt, that helps to fuel divisions and to, de and to demonize people, those that are often called other, you know, those people who do not look like us, who do not share our language, culture, dress, religion, or values. However, it is incumbent upon us, an institution of higher education that values critical reflection to engage, to engage in discussions that dig deep into the whys. Why were people protesting that warm evening of July 7th? Why hasn't enough been done to address the issues of equity and social justice in, ju in Dallas and beyond? Why hasn't enough been done to bring communities together to engage in honest conversations? Why hasn't enough been done to build bridges between our brave officers and those that they are sworn to protect? There was a television program the other night one of the ladies that was shot, one of the protesters that was shot, was so gratified with the uniform officers that came around her to protect her. And she said, were it not for them, she and her young children might have been hurt. That's a tribute to the kind of things that we should be talking about and that we should be about as a community here in Dallas. So today, we remember the lost lives the fathers, sons, brothers, uncles that did not make it home that evening. And those injured because of senseless violence. And we recognize that El Centro College, we have met the challenge as in, exemplified by the hashtag El Centro Stronger. And we are defined by the core values of strength, community, resilience, diversity, service, and hope. Each of us, each of you in this audience is El Central Strong. Thank you. Now it is my pleasure to invite uh, EC Conflict Management Program Coordinator and Dallas City Council Person Adam Magoo. So it's, it's significant that it was Thursday night. Um, many of our classes that I teach here in mediation teach, go from five to nine on Thursday evening. And Thursday last year, I happened to not have a class that evening. And so I was able to go pick my kids up from soccer practice, which was a luxury that I, I enjoyed thoroughly. And it was right when I had picked them up, it had gotten dark, had the radio on, and I hear shots fired. And you know, my first thought was, you know, we've had so many protests, we've had so many issues, it was only a matter of time until something like this happened. And I kind of just thought, okay, well, we've got the best police officers, we've got the best folks, we, it, we'll handle it, it's fine. And I kept driving, and as I was driving home, the news was escalating of what was happening. And I remember walking in the door, I put my kids over to my wife, she was still not knowing what had happened, and I called my... My previous job before being a city council member is I was the chief of staff for Mayor Rawlings. And I called the current chief of staff and I said, what's going on, how bad is this? And he said, 
look, we know we have officers down. We don't know how bad yet, but we know we have them down. And I just said, can I help? And at this point, it wasn't about being an elected official. It wasn't anything else. It was the same kind of feeling that all of us around this, when you first started hearing about it, you want to do something. And I expected him to say, no, you can't do anything right now. And he just said, yes. <laughs> and I said, all right, I'm on my way. And I, and I remember this moment of, of telling my kids and my wife, I'm like, look, I'm, I'm heading down there. And they said, by this time, you started to see something on the news. And my son said, don't go. And I just had a window into the lives of what each one of our officers feel, whether it be Dallas County Community College or DART Police or DPD, as they leave each day. And I was honored and blessed to be able to come in and go to the Emergency Operations Center and be there with a group of our, our leaders that were trying to determine how to respond and what to do and how to inform all of us of what was going on. And I was standing next to Chief Brown um, as we were preparing for the first press conference and getting everything together and things are moving so quickly and you're getting information out. And about that time I heard him say, he's in the parking garage at El Centro. And so now it's, it's not just my police family that's involved, it's my El Centro family that's involved. And I start trying to figure out who can I call, what can I figure out, because in every one of our circumstances, we all have a significant emotional event like this. We remember it forever, for the rest of our lives. But we start thinking of those closest to us first and then start moving that circle out of who we can contact and who we can check on. And I started doing that like anybody else would. And then something happened. They had the picture of, of the suspect, we thought. And we're all taking pictures of our cell phone and trying to tweet it out. And we're walking through City Hall to have the first press conference. And, you know, you get caught up in the moment of trying to get things done and get information out. And you start thinking about what's happening right here at, at our school, at our city, at our home, with our loved ones all involved and being targeted. And it was just a moment that, you know, we... I think about it a lot. I think about it every time I will go over to the R building to teach a class or go to there and I, I see the windows that were knocked out from where he was shooting. I know right where Sergeant Smith was shot. I know where this occurred and it, it's something that we live and relive every single time we walk these streets. But I, then I immediately go to all of our brothers and sisters and the families of those that, that feel that every single morning when they get up and go to bed and every single time and I just, I just have such a, a, a heart for, for that sacrifice that they give. And so while we think about it on the year anniversary, um, I hope we continue to remember all the sacrifices that are given each and every single day. Now, I was, I, right afterwards, I got the opportunity to do some, some interviews, and they would ask, you know, this happened in Dallas. What do you think about it happened in Dallas? And I remember my honest first thought was, if it could happen anywhere, no one would ever wish this on any, anybody in any city. But we were probably the most prepared of any big city in the country to deal with this because we have connections, we have relationships that have started years and years that can help us go through and move forward from something like this. And so I, I said, I'm, I'm, I think that we are going to come together as a city like no city ever has. And I've seen that. Um, we have a year of unity. We have so many different uh, church, church groups coming together and communities coming together and people working and we're talking in ways that we haven't talked before, which is great. But then the follow-up question is, have we, how are race relations here in the city now? Are we better? You know, I don't know if I can answer that question yet. I teach mediation. I'm involved in a lot of high-stakes conflict. And what we always do when there's conflict is we immediately look for information that justifies our side and discredits the others. Doesn't matter what it is. Real news, fake news, whatever it is, we look for information that bolsters what we think already and we discredit the other side. And I think the divided country that we have is still prevalent. And I think the call for some, a day like today is to say, all right, we remember and we will remember each and every day moving forward but it doesn't matter if we don't change ourselves and if we don't use this to absolutely move forward in a way that's different for this whole city. And in many ways, we're doing it. But we have to make the decision, each one of us internally, to change ourselves, 
to not be the first one to find some bit of information that's negative about somebody else that divides us and post it all over social media, but to analyze, to sit back and think through what's really going on in our communities and to have real meaningful conversations that establish a relationship, not just a social media post. And so I'm encouraged, I'm challenged, I'm thankful to be part of this event today. I'm thankful for each and every one of our officers and our first responders and all those that are out there giving. And I'm committing to continuing having those kind of dialogues that really make this make a difference for our El Centro family, for our city of Dallas, and for our entire country moving forward. So thank you for this opportunity to be just a small part of this. And um, I really look forward to seeing what this next year, the next mo months and weeks moving forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council Member Magoo. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Paige Blue Jacket, and I have the honor of introducing a a true hero today, even though all of you who serve us every day, you're heroes every day. Um, but we are, we are very honored here at El Centro College to have someone like El Centro College officer, not officer, sorry, Chief Hannigan um, and DCCD Commander Hannigan. I'm not sure which one it is. Commander Hannigan, okay. Well, he was here that night and he did lead all of our officers who were here in the building, including uh, Corporal Shaw and Officer Abbott, who is here with us today. Thank you very much. So we'd just like to hear a couple remarks from you. Well, good morning, and uh, thank you very much for coming and spending this time with us. As Paige said, my name is Joseph Hannigan, and I have the distinct honor of being the commanding officer of the police officers assigned to the Yale Central College. About two years ago, I put a request for some equipment in with my then boss, David Browning. Uh, it, it got denied, and this repeated itself month in and month out. Uh, and then finally David said, well, make a case for it. So I wrote down and I made a case for the equipment I was asking for, and it was tactical equipment. And I was advised that in 50 years, El Centro has never needed rifles or tactical plates or helmets or anything of that nature. And I said to him, because it hasn't happened in the past 50 years, does not mean that we might not experience it in the next 50. We need to be prepared. And Dr. Adamus approved all of that equipment, so we had it on hand that night when Xavier Johnson broke into our building. I'd like to acknowledge my boss, Chief Hill, who is, uh, <laughs> as you may know, all of the colleges have, uh, reorganized and we're no longer seven separate colleges. We are now the DCCD Police Department, which brings us to 160 sworn police officers. Uh, and Chief Hill is guiding us and bringing us through that process and uh, making sure that we have all the equipment we need now. Uh, I'd also like to mention my wife, Jen, Jen standing right over here. I'd like to thank her for coming. So to go along with the story, uh, I got my equipment. Uh, July 7th happened, that equipment was utilized, and uh, Chief Hill is gonna make sure that we have all the equipment we need for any future uh, things that El Central might run into, which, knock on wood, we'll never see again. Looking back on it though, the thing that touched me most about the aftermath of July 7th was the outpouring of support that we've seen from the community, from the, our own students, our faculty, our staff, we noticed the difference. We noticed the change in them. Uh, just standing outside, we have people come up to us all day long 
thank us, shake our hands. Uh, don't, well, we were having the security perimeter. We were having women cook for us and bring it over casseroles and drinks. And, and it was just amazing to see. Just completely amazing and humbling. Uh, and it's one of the things that has made me so proud to be a law enforcement officer and to work in such a great place. Uh, again, I hope we never experience a tragedy like we experienced last July 7th. Uh, but anybody who works here, visits here, uh, you have some very highly trained police officers to protect you. And feel free to come as many times as you want because we are prepared. Uh, and thank you for the, all your support, uh, the students, faculty, and staff, and all the citizens, the community around us. It's very, very much appreciated by each and every one of us. Thank you. Hello. Um, so the next person that we are going to hear from, um, I remember I... We stood in the hallway here at El Centro College a couple of weeks after this event happened, and an hour and a half went by. We were talking about this, we were talking about our community, um, how this affected everyone here in Dallas and in the nation. And um, she is such a profound speaker, and she just has an amazing way of looking at things and learning how to resolve things. So I want to introduce you to Rachel Royal. She's one of our students. She also works here. She was not here on the night of July 7th, um, but she did spend a lot of time counseling other students and faculty and staff members afterwards. So she's been very active in the healing process. So please welcome Rachel Royal. Good morning, and thank you so very much. Um, people who know me will tell you I'm not a person that's ever at a loss of words. And I'm very thankful for that, because words are what connect us. But unfortunately, sometimes words are also what disconnect us. And this was an occasion that I took a lot of time, and I put a lot of effort to make sure that I chose my words so that they could be received as I felt them in my heart. I don't usually write speeches, I kind of free willy it, and that's my thing. But I thought today was a little too special for that, and I thought the topic and that the people might be in a sensitive place, so I just wanted to make sure that I wrote it down right, and I pray that I'm able to express it correctly. Before I start, I would like to take a moment of silence for the lives that were lost prior to July 7th, 2016. I would like to take a moment of silence for those lives that were lost on July 7th, 2016. And I would like to take a moment of silence for those who have lost their lives since July 7th of 2016. Thank you. My name is Rachel Royal, and I'm honored to be here with you today to share my heart and insights concerning the events that affected our college and our community as of a year ago today. July 7th will forever be a date in which we will remember and reflect on how we as a community suffered a great loss. We will remember that as our college community and our city became a place that drew the attention of people from all across our nation, we made a pledge to be strong. We were and we are El Centro strong. We made a pledge that we would not allow the events that took place on that day to define us as a community and that we would get through it by being there for each other. We would be the example of how to successfully interact and engage with others regardless of their religion, race, social status, educational background, nationality, gender, or sexual orientation. We would be better as a community, and more importantly, we would be better as individuals. This is what we said. That is how we felt. However, 
For me to be completely transparent on how I feel today regarding this occasion, it is of utter importance that we start just a few days prior to July 7th. I am the proud mother of five young boys. My son, Demario, celebrated his 11th birthday on July the 1st. He was so excited to have his friends over to help him celebrate. He has a love for life and is filled with adventure and he sees the world through the eyes of true childlike innocence. His biggest fear was that his friend who was competing with him on the latest video game challenge would eventually beat his high score. As his friends began to come over to our house, I watched children from all backgrounds, black, white, Hispanic, and Asian, run, laugh, and play together. I saw them coexisting with each other in a way that was simply admirable. After everyone left, Demario and I opened his various gifts and he expressed his appreciation for his friends, making his day so very special. It really was a great day. I remember looking at him and having a feeling of pride that I had taught him to be such a giving and a loving person. I had no idea how quickly things would change. I would soon become filled with fear and rage. I would hold my children and cry over the uncertainty of their futures. What a difference a day makes. The next significant date prior to July 7th was the day before, July the 6th. That morning, the boys and I started our day as we usually did. I cooked breakfast, and after the boys finished completing their household chores, they asked if they could go outside and play. As they ran out of the house, I began to check my cell phone for messages. I immediately went to my Facebook account, and as I was scrolling, I saw the most horrific video I've ever witnessed. I had to watch it four more consecutive times because I couldn't grasp the reality that this was actual live footage and not someone making some horrible joke. You see, I had made a conscious effort to not watch the news for months because I just couldn't handle hearing about yet another unarmed person or a legally armed person being killed and the circumstances surrounding their deaths raising more questions than answers. In my own way, not hearing about these occurrences daily almost took away the fact that it was so frequently happening. I found myself trying to be as unbiased as I could and I tried to make sure that I took all accounts and perspectives into consideration. I have the utmost respect for law enforcement, and I know that the service they contribute to help protect and serve our community is immeasurable. I also feel that everyone has to be held accountable for their choices and actions, whether you wear a uniform or not. Perception is very important, and so often it's our misperceptions of each other that's the root of conflict. I recall a situation where some student leaders had approached me and told me they were planning to walk out and protest our school's security policies and the interactions they had experienced with some of our campus police officers. My first question to them was, had they spoken to anyone about their concerns? I was a little alarmed when they told me that they had not. They told me that no one would be willing to listen to them and automatically would take the officer's side. I asked them to please allow me the opportunity to address their concerns with our administration before they took any further action. I spoke to our vice president, Dr. Crawford, and I also spoke to Chief Hannigan. Both Dr. Crawford and Chief Hannigan were very eager to assist me, and the chief explained about how some criminal activities on our campus committed by people who were not students had resulted in our officers being more diligent in seeking to find out who was coming onto our campus and what their manner of business was. After meeting back up with these leaders from the student organizations and explaining everything to them, their attitudes towards the officers turned from aggravation to appreciation. Now just imagine what the outcome would have been if we never would have taken that time out just to talk. As I began pondering these thoughts, I went outside to get my children. I could no longer just pretend that these situations did not exist. I told them they needed to come into the house so we could talk. I asked them, please, to never play hide and seek around our apartments because I was afraid that someone may mistakenly think they were up to no good. I explained to them what they should do if they were ever stopped by law enforcement officers. I tried to think of every way possible that I could keep them safe. I was nervous and at a complete loss. They know the difference between right and wrong, and I know that they're just little boys. However, I also know that Soon, they will be young men, and people who think they are cute boys could possibly view them as dangerous men. I wanted to believe that if they did the right thing and made the right choices, everything would be fine, but would it? 
Mothers were bearing their children who went to the store to buy snacks, who were playing in parks, selling cigarettes, and whose cars had broken taillights. I, for the first time in my life, felt completely vulnerable and hopeless. And then, the very next day, was July the 7th. I had been up all night, and I decided not to go to campus. I was physically and mentally exhausted. When I read the alert to stay away from campus, I was not immediately alarmed because this had happened before. But then, I got a phone call that stated there had been a shooting on campus. The reports on the news continued to describe the shooting that took place and the fact that it was going on at our campus. I immediately reached out to as many people as I could think of to check to make sure that they would be okay. It would be days before I would get the full report on the events that took place. I was in complete disbelief. My heart was so heavy for all of those who lost their lives, those who walked alongside protesters to ensure their safety at the risk of losing their own. I felt so torn. I wanted to be fully able to mourn for those who lost their lives on July the 7th. But the truth was that I was still trying to process the information from the previous day, the previous month, and the previous year. I wasn't sure how much more my heart could take. I felt completely hopeless and helpless. On July 12th, there was an interfaith memorial service held in honor of the slain officers. Our previous president, Barack Obama, was the speaker. I was one of several student leaders who was chosen to attend. I listened intently as the president delivered an eloquent and heartfelt speech. He spoke about the fallen officers, and he also spoke of the fallen citizens. As I looked at the mothers and the fathers and the husbands and the wives and the children of the officers, I felt an immediate connection to them. We were all hurting. We all had experienced fear and loss. We all wanted individuals to be held accountable. We all wanted to feel as if we mattered. It's a shame that people tried to make you feel that you had to choose to mourn for one group, the slain officers, or the other, the slain citizens. Every life that is lived matters, and every life that is lost matters. We are all human, and death does not discriminate. That was the day that my journey of healing began. Our country is hurting. Once again, people are feeling unseen, unvalued, unheard, and as if they don't matter. Forgiveness happens in a moment, but healing is truly a process. We must become comfortable with being uncomfortable. We must be honest with ourselves before we can ever expect to be honest with anyone else. It was only two weeks ago that I attended a diversity and equity training seminar where I voiced my concerns with participating in this event. I just wasn't sure that I would be able to articulate my feelings without causing anyone any offense. I wasn't sure if I could say that even though it's been a year, I still have days that I really struggle to process everything that is happening. However, I learned a very valuable lesson at that seminar. Silence has a voice even though it says no words. To say nothing can be just as damaging as saying the wrong thing. So today, here I am. Being strong doesn't mean we don't feel pain. It just means we don't allow pain to feel us. As we continue to move forward and accomplish our various goals and personal endeavors, it is important that we remember all of those who lost their lives because the best way to honor them is to make sure that we live a life that is impactful and a life that makes a difference. We truly, truly, truly need each other. It's not just a montage to say, united we stand and divided we fall. It is the truth. El Central College and all those who are in our community continue to strive for success because we live by our motto of changing lives through higher education. We embody the task of being critical thinkers, and not just individuals who point out the problems, but we are those who roll up our sleeves and work hard to seek to find resolution. We are El Centro, and we are strong. Thank you so very much for the opportunity to share my heart and my insight today on this day of remembrance. God bless you.
Thank you, Rachel. Um, one more time for Rachel. It takes a lot of courage to stand up here. Um, and uh, I, I do apologize, I didn't introduce myself to you all earlier. My name is Paige Blue Jacket. Um, I have been around the El Centro family since about 2010. Um, and I'm very honored to now be employed here at El Centro College. This place is my heart. Um, and for those of you who know me, you've heard this story a million times and I'm so sorry. But there's a lot of new friends here today. Um, uh, at 30 years old, um, getting laid off of my job and having basically no futures, uh, no career options, um, and being a high school dropout from Richardson, Texas. I walked in this school with the thought that maybe I could pass an English class and try to get an education. I, for 30 years of my life, believed that I was not capable, smart enough, or good enough to get a college education. But that completely changed when I came here to El Centro College. And if you've ever met anyone here at El Centro who works here, who's been a student, who's an alumni, who's an officer, uh, faculty, staff, part-time people, if you know El Centro, you love El Centro. Right? Look at all you guys with your t-shirts on back there. Thank you for everyone. And today is about so many things. It is about community. It is about the resilience and renewal of the families who lost their loved ones, um, the families and the officers who were injured, um, any of the people who participated in the peaceful protest who were injured, our community. I mean, could you imagine being a student here or an employee here and trying to come back to work after that happened? Because it, it affected everyone, obviously, because that's why we're all here in this room today. And a lot of social media has been mentioned today. Um, so we all know, we read the feed and you think, gosh, I need to delete that person because I don't want to read that anymore. It's always this side or that side or you have to choose a side. I am challenging all of you today to do something different with your social media today. Um, we, are, we have been planning for almost a year um, with our El Centro College Aesthetics Committee, our art department, and working with many different local Dallas artists uh, to create an art installation and a sculpture that will be uh, located right outside of the entrance here on Elm Street. And uh, this sculpture is going to be abstract. Um, it is going to be illustrative of all the things we've talked about today. Revival, renewal, strength, the center of Dallas. El Centro truly is the center of Dallas, and it is one of our beacons. And um, so we have four artists who have submitted renderings, but we do have to raise a little bit of money to make this happen. And we think that this is important because we want everyone who's been affected by this event to, when they walk in our campus, have a chance to reflect on all of our community, all of our relations, our diversity, hope, just the El Centro spirit in general. So today, with your social media, take one minute and go to lcentralcollege.edu backslash stronger. Take a look at the plans that we have. Um, I can announce today that we have chosen four final, four final artists, and they are all locally based in Dallas. That's Chris Latanzio, Ryder Richards, Celia Alvarez Munoz, Sorry, y'all, my pronunciation is not good. And uh, sorry, Celia, um, Daryl Loster. Um, so we are very honored and thrilled to have them participating. And at 1 p.m. today on elcentrocollege.edu backslash stronger, we will be posting photos of the renderings that they've submitted. And we would love your feedback. Um, and we'd like to hear from the community. What do you like? What do you want to see? What will make you feel hopeful and excited when you walk in those doors every day? Um, we do have one other art piece that we would like to unveil to you right now. Um, we actually had a, um, 
we had a call to our students, to our faculty, to our staff, and asked them, what does El Centro mean to you? Because everyone has an answer for that, right? It's probably all different, but they're in the same uh, sentiment, and because all of us love El Centro. <laughs> and um, so we asked them to submit uh, drawings, pictures, photos, and our, our whole art department, led by our student, Stephanie Johnson. Stephanie, are you here? Can you stand up, please? So give it up for Stephanie. If you can, we are about to conclude, and we are going to go with Stephanie right over here to our El Centro Student Art Gallery, and she is going to show us what this this college has created describing what El Centro means to them and she'll explain it to us briefly and then we will com conclude our program so thank you so much to everyone for being here and uh, if you'll join me in the art gallery that would be great thank you my name is Stephanie Johnson and I'm a very proud non-traditional student at El Centro as they say non-traditional student uh, those of you who've been in the Deep Ellum area for any length of time or have been officers in the Deep Ellum area, you might know of us anyway from his youth. Can you do more? Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Is this better? Yeah. All right, great. All right, as I said, I'm a non traditional student here at El Centro. I'm very proud to be a non traditional student here at El Centro. Um, if you look around, this you see a lot of white, you see a lot of paper, it's kind of a moving sculpture, it's very ecologically friendly, obviously. The main theme behind this is the idea of the birch tree. Birch trees grow in areas that are usually ravaged by destruction. They are adaptable, they are strong, and they will rebuild areas faster than traditional trees will, because they do grow fast. Uh, so that became really the theme behind this, the idea of resilience, the idea that we will grow out of destruction, that we can um, take places previously ravaged by tragedy and make it once our own once again. And that is also indicative of our student body, not just this incident, but our student body as a whole. Usually our student body are filled with people like me, 44-year-old non-traditional students, people who are trying to start over, people who are themselves coming out of tragedy. So the theme transfers in all kinds of families within the El Centro family. When we asked students and staff to submit images, we told them to submit with what El, El Centro means to you. Interestingly enough, the images that we mostly received were of officers in respect to those who had fallen. The students chose what this ended up becoming, and it evolved over time. So all the images you'll see, we've got images on the wall behind, those are prints, those are actually from the candlelight vigil last year, and uh, those, are, those are mine, so you can put my name on that. But if you look behind, you see the slideshow runs through all the submitted images, and we have it projected here, as well as on the base piece over there that is the birch forest piece when you first walk in. Also behind you on the podium over there, there's a binder. Those are all cards and letters that were sent from around the country to our DCCCD officers after the incident. So you can look through at all the love that came in from all over. So as you remember as you walk through here and enjoy this today, just remember that this is a community art piece. This was made by everybody. And this is everybody joining together and giving love in the spirit of resilience and in the spirit of growth out of tragedy. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you.